Hey guys, in last few videos, we have looked at different concepts related to band gap reference generator circuits. In this video, we will consider some transistor level implementations complete with amplifier and startup circuit. Let's start with the branch which will generate our final output. So we already know that PTAT voltage will appear across resistor R4 and the CTAT voltage would appear across diode D3. And the current in this branch would be a PTAT current. And we would require a PTAT current source in form of a PMOS transistor on the top of reference voltage. Now from this branch we can calculate the minimum supply voltage required for a correct operation. A typical band gap reference voltage is 1.25 volt. And we would require few hundred millivolts across transistor to keep it in saturation. So in total we will require 1.4 to 1.5 volt of supply for this circuit to operate correctly. So let's assume our typical supply to be 1.8 volt with some variations around it. So this is a very commonly used analog supply range for lower geometry process nodes. Now let's insert the core of the band gap. So we have two branches here, one containing only diode and other containing a larger diode and a register. And we know if we make Vn and Vp equal, then current flowing in these two branches will be PTAT. And in order to make these two voltages equal, we need to now insert an amplifier. Now there are two flavors of amplifiers available depending on the type of the input transistors. So we can either have PMOS input transistor or so called PDIF or NMOS input transistor or so called NDIF. Now there are many factors deciding which kind of diff pair should be used. And one of the most important is input common mode range. Input voltage in this case is CTAT voltage across diode. Let's assume diode voltage at room temperature to be around 700 millivolts and CTAT slope to be minus 2 millivolt per degree Celsius. So now we can calculate the diode voltage across whole range of temperature. So we have amplifier input voltage ranging from around 850 millivolt to 450 millivolts. Now lower input voltage is better for PMOS because it has more margin and higher input voltage is better for NMOS. So worst case condition for PMOS would be 850 millivolt and for NMOS would be 450 millivolts. So now let's see how much margin these two diff pair have at their respective worst case conditions. So we see that even if we consider the worst case supply of 1.62 volts, the margin that PMOS has is 770 millivolts, which is considerably higher than worst case NMOS margin, which is 450 millivolts. And that is precisely the reason that most of the conventional band gap circuit use PDIF as their input pair. So let us also stick with PDIF. So in this implementation, we are biasing the amplifier by the PTAT current of band gap itself. And it is a very common technique, although by no means the only technique. Now coming to load devices, we have a few options available here as well. We can use current mirror as the load stage, or we can go for more advanced options like folded cast code. Both options are used frequently in the practical design. Let's stick to the current mirror in this video purely because of its simplicity. So here is our amplifier. But because of the output common mode limitation of this amplifier, we cannot simply connect its output directly to the PMOS stages. So we need another stage in between. So here is our second stage. Now notice that this second stage is not actually a gain stage. Because the load device is low impedance diode connected transistor. So this is more of a level converting stage. Next, now let's take stability and frequency compensation. So how many poles are there in this circuit? So if we attach one pole to one node in the signal path, there are four poles. Notice that I'm ignoring the pole at Vn node. There are two reasons for it. First reason is that in normal mode, diode offers a very low impedance. So we can assume Vn to be practically constant. The second reason is that this Vn node comes in the positive feedback loop. While in the normal mode, it is a negative feedback which will dominate over positive feedback. Coming back to our four poles, the second and fourth pole would be high frequency pole. And this is because of the presence of low impedance diode connected transistors. Node 1 is the high impedance node. So this pole will be a low frequency pole. And ignoring the diode impedance again, the third pole will be decided by the value of R1. 
Typical value of R1 is few tens to few hundreds of kilo ohms. So in its higher limit, it will just start to deteriorate the phase margin of the system. So one can rightly argue that we don't need a compensation here because it is effectively a single pole system. There is only one dominant pole. But better safe than sorry, let's anyway put a simple dominant pole compensation here. And to complete the circuit, let's also indicate the connection at input of amplifier. Okay, so now we have put core of the circuit in place. The only remaining piece in the puzzle is startup. So we know that in order to start the circuit, we need to insert current at appropriate nodes. So let's first consider how to generate that startup current itself. Startup current need not be very accurate, but it must guarantee the current generation, that is its own startup. We have seen once a circuit in the beginning of PTAT CTAT video. It is a diode connected transistor followed by a resistance. The circuit will carry current as soon as there is voltage drop across this resistor. This condition is met as soon as supply voltage is higher than the threshold voltage of this transistor. So this is a very simple and reliable way of generating current at even a very small supply voltages. Current in this branch is approximately given by this equation, which is VDD minus VGS of this transistor divided by the resistance value. So we can control this current by controlling this resistance. Now startup current is usually few hundred of nano ampere to few micro ampere. So in order to achieve that level of current, the resistance needs to be very big. For example, if we assume 1 micro ampere of startup current and 0.8 volt across transistor, then for typical supply voltage, this resistor needs to be 1 mega ohms. So it's not unusual to have several mega ohms of resistance in this branch. Now, big resistor can have significant area penalty. So in many area sensitive designs, this resistance is implemented by the means of transistors. One common way is to connect several long channel and merge devices in the series. And their gate is connected to supply. In other words, it's always on weak and MOS. The disadvantage of this scheme is larger PVT variation in startup current. So keeping this in mind, let's proceed with resistance in this video. The next logical question is where to insert the current. We want positive feedback to dominate in the beginning, so we can insert current into VN node. But since amplifier derives the current from the band gap itself, we also want these PMOSes to carry the current. So one way of doing this is to insert the current into this node. But equally valid way of inserting the current into these PMOSes is to take out the current from this node or insert the current into this node. As a matter of fact, in principle, all of these techniques can be designed to work. But most of these nodes will result in excessive peaking in the output voltage. This is because even if we insert current in these branches, the amplifier will wake up by its own time constant, and which is determined by its dominant pole compensation. In fact, smoothest possible startup is achieved by inserting the current into this compensation capacitor. So in other words, waking up your slowest node first is the best policy here. So we mirror the current and dump this current into capacitor. The next step is to stop this dumping when circuit has successfully started. The most common way is to sense the current in the band gap circuit and stop when the current is big enough. So this is one way of doing it. So this branch is comparing the startup current with band gap current. When there is no current in the band gap, this node is pulled high by the startup current and the inverter output is zero, hence this PMOS is on. When sufficient current builds up in the band gap, the node is pulled low and the current dumping is stopped. So this scheme also puts an upper limit to the startup current. Across all PVT corners, the startup current must always be less than the final band gap current. A commonly used value of maximum ratio of band gap current to startup current is 4 to 5. In other words, the maximum startup current at a given PVT corner should be 4 to 5 times less than the band gap current. Now, one may be tempted to turn off the startup current generation branch as well along with this branch to save the power. But I must caution against it. It should never be done. If it is done, then it may result in a stuck state in the circuit. In that stuck state, the band gap circuit is still not on, but startup circuit has turned off. 
So we see that startup circuit consumes currents in these two branches, which is always present. This may be a big issue in low power circuits. But if low power is absolutely critical and you can trade some accuracy for the power, then there is another way. Remember we said that we can start the circuit by inserting the current into this branch. So if we replace this transfer by a register, then this register would act as a startup circuit. As supply ramps up, this register forces this amplifier node to go up as well. And this would force current in the two branches of amplifier. And this current would eventually force current into these two diode branches. And this will cause circuit to start up. But now because of this resistance, the power supply and common mode rejection of this amplifier will not be very good. Also bias current of amplifier will change with the supply, which will change its GM with the supply. This variation will cause inaccuracies in the final band gap output voltage. But for ultra low power application, this technique can be considered. Also notice that this technique works only for the p-type differential input pair. As a last step, let's consider some options we have in the output generation stage. We know that we can generate the output voltage in these two branches as well. Using these stages will obviously save the area and power that we spent in this final branch. So is there any advantage of using this dedicated reference branch at all? In fact, there is an advantage. Notice that this reference branch is out of the feedback loop. So any change in the output capacitance does not change the stability of the system. Now this can be a crucial factor if you are not sure about your output capacitance value. Now, let's say we know our output capacitance value rather well and we are interested in saving some area and power. So we can get rid of this final branch. Now we have two options in hand. Is there any preference there? In fact, there is. Recall that for startup, we want VN node to come up quickly. So we would like to avoid any delay in this branch. And for that reason, we will tap the output from the other branch. Actually, there is another option available. There are certain advantages in shorting these two nodes out. So in this case, only one node is available. Right. So in this video, we have considered a transfer level schematic of a bandgap reference generator. Except for the fact that a real practical circuit does not often use the diodes. They use BJTs. So we'll take BJTs in our next video. For this video, post your comments below and thanks for watching.